On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, it's the What The Ship Edition, June 16th, 2022. I'm your host, Sam Mercaglia. Welcome to What The Ship, our top five stories across the maritime sector, the best channel on maritime shipping news on all of YouTube. I'm making that allegation. Not sure if it's true or not, but let's go ahead and go with it. So a lot of stories to talk about, but before we do so, a couple of quick things. Number one, if you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe, hit the bell, so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. So yesterday we had a story on the Marist Surabaya, which grounded coming into Savannah, working on some details on that story. The, the, what I'm hearing right now is that a blown fuse, yes, a blown fuse, a couple of dollars, went out on the rudder angle indicator that basically tells the pilot and the master and the mate on watch, when you turn the wheel of the helm, what angle the rudder is at. And since the rudder didn't show any angle, they kept turning the wheel. And what happened was is the ship was making a right-hand turn into the channel. She kicked out further than expected and grounded by the stern. So that's the rumor I'm hearing yet, waiting to get confirmation on that. But as soon as I do, I'll be sure to include it. All right, let's jump into our five stories. Story number one deals with a video I did just the other day talking about President Biden's speech at the port of LA where he threatened to punch in the face the nine leading container companies. Uh, that in turn has led to the passage of the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. As I said in that video, and I believe it's time, he was basically taking a very vocal stance against the ocean shipping companies because he wanted to give coverage for the passage of this Ocean Shipping Reform Act. And it is passed to the House. The Senate bill is the one that went to the House. And according to the story from Mike Schuller over at G Captain, what we see is the bill has passed 369 to 42 over to the House. Now, both versions, the Senate version and now the House ratifying the Senate version is done. And now that bill will go to the president for his signature. Now, this bill doesn't do what everybody thinks it does. And I'm going to do an entire video that breaks this down because I think it's very important to break down what exactly the Ocean Shipping Reform Act does. It does give the Federal Maritime Commission some power to review, legislate, not legislate, regulate, excuse me, and oversee certain aspects. Now, the World Shipping Council from their headquarters deep in a volcano in the South Pacific. I'm sorry, I'm, just, I'm joking about that. But the World Shipping Council, it's, it's a terrible name. It sounds like an evil organization. And it's not. It's a batch of good companies and, and services. But I will say that the World Shipping Council has been let down by, I think, their public relations in this. I don't think they did a very good job in talking about what those nine shipping companies have done, especially over the past two years during COVID. They've come out against this, obviously. But now the question is, how is this law going to be administered? Uh, series of reactions here, obviously, from Daniel Maffey, the, the head of the FMC, is applauding this. It's going to give him more power. It's going to increase the power and reach of his, his agency. So that's going to be important. President Biden did this. This is a, a means to show that he's helping to try to fight inflation. He's trying to deflect inflation onto different issues. One of them is Putin and the war in Iraq, and excuse me, in Kuwait, Kuwait, I can't talk today, on Ukraine and Russia, but also on high shipping costs. And so this is a way to say, well, this is the reason there's inflation. No, there's a lot of reasons why there's inflation. Does this contribute to it? Sure, but there's a lot of things that contribute to it. Uh, this is the World Shipping Council that came out on their statement. Uh, the OSS, OSRA marks the conclusion of the legislative phase and transmission to the Federal Maritime Commission rulemaking process. We appreciate the time and effort that Congress has put into crafting this bill. No, they don't. And look forward to engaging in productive conversations with the Federal Maritime Com Commission to implement OSRA. That means they're going to beg the, the FMC not to do certain provisions. This is the thing. I don't know why they weren't saying from the rooftops. Throughout the pandemic, ocean carriers have gone all out to keep goods moving, deploying every vessel, every container available, increasing sailings and investing for the future. In 2021, carriers ordered a record-breaking 555 vessels worth 42.5 billion US dollars. I'm not sure that's the right thing to say at that moment. 
and 208 vessels worth $18.4 billion have been ordered year to date in 2022. Again, they're talking about the profits, how they're spending their profits. But as long as American ports, rail yards, and warehouses remain overloaded and unable to cope with the increased trade levels, vessels will remain stuck outside ports to the detriment of the importers as well as the exporters. They're literally telling you that it's your fault. You know, it's the fact that your ports are crappy in the United States. This is the reason you have it. And it's hard to argue that when the World Bank does a study of U.S. ports and the two bottom ones of 370 ports is Long Beach at 369 and L.A. at 370, which handle 40 percent of all the containers coming into the United States. So the World Shipping Council is pointing at the U.S. The U.S. is pointing at the World Shipping Council and everything is great. Oh. God, just seriously, can we not get the nine heads of these companies in a room and talk about this? They hide, they're not there, and, and, and this, this happens. And what we're going to wind up with is legislation that doesn't do everything they think it does and has the potential to cause some undetermined impact. At the same time, let me be clear, they sit here and cite fact-finding 29, the fact that the Federal Car uh, uh, Maritime Commission has, quote, our markets are competitive and the high ocean freight rates have been determined by unprecedented consumer demand, particularly in the United States, that overwhelm the supply of vessel capacity, congestion further constrained available capacity. They can slap themselves on the back all they want that Rebecca Dye found that there was competition there. But understand, going forward, that's the issue that everybody has concern with. What are these nine companies? And then they try to deflect here to 22 companies. But the nine companies control 85% of the freight going across in three alliances. So they are doing this. What they need to be concerned about is the DOJ, the Department of Justice, coming about them with antitrust. And then you get these comments here from the president and CEO of the International Dairy Food Association. Listen, there, there are exporters in the United States who are screaming to high heaven that World Shipping Council's shipping companies were not taking out exports, and they brought this on themselves. They kept not taking the exports, and they can really only blame themselves. Michael Dykes said this, uh, the uh, president of the American Farm Bureau, Zippy Duval. Zippy Duval, <laughs> that is a fantastic name. Anybody who goes by that name, God, I don't think that was his given name, but th that's great. Uh, Peter DeFazio, the chair of the House Committee on Transportation and Inf Infrastructure. I'm still laughing about Zippy, sorry. National Retail Federation, uh, and then uh, Senator Maria Cantwell. All these comments are here. And what we know for a fact here, and, and there's other stories here that there, there's the FMC story here, excuse me, the uh, signing by Biden in uh, American Shipper. We got here the port congestion, which is still a huge problem, according to Fitch. We're seeing LA and Long Beach heating up in their competition. Uh, we're seeing LA with peak season coming and just boom times for US container ports throughout the United States. So, you know, we're about to see record number of containers coming in. And you look at the main numbers, we're seeing that. Now, there's a big fight going on right now about whether US imports are falling off a cliff between different news reporting agencies. What I can tell you at the numbers we're looking at right now, coming into US ports, they're not abating. We're seeing uh, huge numbers coming in as of May. We're going into the third quarter here soon, which is the really the peak of shipping where most goods come across. But what we're gonna start seeing is massive congestion. We're seeing the number of containers in ports increasing, massive log jam off the port of Savannah, off of other ports. Uh, we're definitely seeing that, that uptick. And I, I think it has a lot to do with retailers and manufacturers not knowing what to order. So they're ordering everything and it's coming across. Yes, they're, they're stuck with huge inventories, but they're going to try to clear them out. And where this goes with the economy, I don't know. I, I just don't know with inflation, with, with the interest rates going up, stock market taking a tumble. Man, it is hard to read what is going on in this industry. But right now, we're not seeing anything. And understand the container companies with all those ship orders they have are going to bleed tonnage out. They're going to scrap tonnage like crazy. They have almost scrapped nothing this year. But once they get excess capacity, they're going to get rid of all the ships, scrap them, and get more efficient vessels on the way. 
and they're going to control and manipulate the amount of capacity coming across the ocean. It's an interesting story to watch, something we need to keep an eye on. All right, ship to story number two. So second story deals with liquid, liquefied natural gas exports from the United States. If you're unaware, the Freeport LNG terminal down in Texas had a massive explosion that took place that has damaged a good chunk of the facility. This is the Mike Schuller article at G Captain. Uh, won't return to full operations until the end of 2022 due to the damage from last week's fire. fire. Partial operations are expected to resume in about 90 days. The announcement comes in the company's latest update in the fire, which includes some initial findings from its investigation in, into the incident that left the 15 million tons per year export facility, the second largest in the United States, completely offline. The new timing estimates are longer than previously thought, throwing another wrench in the global LNG market. And understand, the U.S. had become the leading exporter of liquefied natural gas. And a lot of that LNG was heading to Russia, excuse me, to Europe to replace Russian LNG. We are also, our biggest importers of Russian, of, of our LNG is China, Korea, and Japan. And so this facility going offline is going to have a, a massive impact in our ability to shore up the ability of other countries to have secure fuel for power plants and their operations. Uh, the startup here is going to be a tough one. Uh, Reuters reported that in March, the Freeport LNG facility loaded 21 cargoes carrying an estimated 64 billion cubic feet of gas to destinations in Europe, South Korea, and China, according to the Department of Energy, up from 15 cargoes in February and 19 in January. So this is a huge facility that is now offline. Go to this next story here. LNG spot right rates reach record as demand soars. So just as you lose the biggest LNG producer in the United States, the spot rates go through the roof. Spot rates for transporting 160,000 cubic meters of LNG in the Atlantic Basin is $100,000 per day and $85,000 per day for Asia or east of Suez. Both prices are substantially up compared to the average for the year with year-to-date average for Asia of 49,000 per day. So you're talking about a $35,000 increase per day over there. It, it's an amazing amount. And this is the moment I have to say that the U.S. needs to open its eyes and do something radical to get some U.S. flag LNG carriers over to it, including if it takes it waiving a Jones Act to bring these back into the U.S. registry so that we can take advantage and have secure vessels going across to make sure that we're ensuring that LNG is going to where it wants to go. Right now, we're at the mercy of the spot market and the, the shipping companies out there about where this LNG is going to go. And I did a whole video on this that talks about this in, in a program that we can put in place that temporarily brings ships into the U.S. registry. And then we build up a shipbuilding uh, fund that will help alleviate the cost to start LNG ship production here in the United States. We built them in the United States in the 70s and 80s, so we can definitely build them. There's no question about that. The question is, do we go ahead and jump into it? And do we have the you know, the backbone and the, the where for all to do it? Or do we allow Qatar and Russia and other countries to be the main LNG transporter around the world? All right, let's jump over to story three. If you talk about the maritime industry, you got to talk about labor. And if you talk about labor, you got to talk about strikes. And around the world right now, we're seeing issues of labor strikes or potential of labor strikes. And labor is in the driver's seat right now. And they have been for a long time. Now we're seeing that little bit change with inflation kicking up. We're seeing some companies bleed off some labor. But right now, especially in the maritime sector, they're in a good position. And we've seen three countries where this is playing out. One was in South Korea. South Korea had a trucker strike. And they literally brought in the military to start moving cargo in South Korea. But this Bloomberg story from June 15th talks about this. South Korean truckers began returning to work and factories resumed deliveries of goods. Companies, including top steelmaker Posco, immediately began deliveries of goods that had been piling up at its warehouse through several petrochemical firms. And this had to do with the fact that uh, uh, truckers wanted better rates, basically. The agreement came after production of Korea's main exports were critically curtailed, raising concerns that a prolonged strike would force 
more severe shutdown. South Korea's economy was at risk, with the trade es uh, ministry estimating that the key industries have seen production disruptions worth about $1.2 billion. And so Korea has fixed this. They brought the truck drivers back. However, starting back up and the, the lag that's been caused by this will take some time to overcome. You can't just turn it back on. Meanwhile, in Germany, German ports are bracing for strikes as the pay talks fail. Shipping lines serving North, North Europe's three biggest container port, third biggest container port, Hamburg, are bracing for further industrial action after wage talks were aborted at the weekend. Negotiations between the German port employees and dock workers trade union ended without a result on Saturday after 10 hours. The union described a revised offer from the Central Association of German Seaport Companies as inadequate. The offer is far below the real wage protection delivered in view of the current rate of price increases of 7.9%. Again, labor is in a great position here, especially with companies making huge profits. They are demanding more and more money. And a strike in Northern Europe and Germany would be severe. Understand Germany is a key hub for a lot of containers that come in and get shuffled around. Losing the German ports would be disastrous. Meanwhile, in the United States, on the West Coast, there seems to be no end in sight between the ILWU and the PMA, the Pacific Maritime Association, in their contract renegotiation. We have already heard they're not going to reach the, the deadline of June 30th for an agreement. Uh, but we do hear from them that of the 22,000 dock workers and 30 ports, quote, neither party is preparing for a strike or a lockout. The ILWU and the PMA which represents more than 70 terminal operators and ocean carriers, said in a joint statement, let me be clear, this happened back in 2014 and 2015, the last time they had negotiations. And that time, as it says here, the side's commitment to keep cargo moving throughout the process would avoid a repeat of the delays and congestions that hampered ports from San Diego to Bellingham during the 2014 talks and extended into 2015. Let's go back in the Wayback Machine, fire the DeLorean up to 88 miles an hour, hot, jump in the hot tub and go back in time to 2014, 2015, when this was happening, they were having contract negotiations and what we saw were delays and congestions. The last time that we saw ships anchored off LA and Long Beach before the most recent time was then. 20 to 30 ships off the port, slowdowns. The economy was just ticking back up after 2008. And then all of a sudden you saw these slowdowns. They didn't go on strike but we saw economic slowdowns. And what this means is, even though the PMA and the West Coast, the West Coast Port Association and the ILWU are saying, listen, we're not gonna go on strike. That doesn't give everybody a lot of comfort. And there's still a lot of angst about what happens here in the future. So that negotiation will be big. Again, when President Biden gave a speech the other day at LA, he never mentioned this even though he met with the ILWU and the PMA, but he never mentioned this in the public speech, which tells me that he didn't want to bring it up. They're talking about it behind the scenes. Marty Walsh, the Secretary of Labor, is going to be involved in this. And I think they're going to have to hammer out something. But the issue of automation is the big sticking point. These ports have to automate. They are dead bottom in terms of efficiency. And the only way to get more efficient is either get more land. That's not happening in Southern California. They've got to automate. The problem with automation is you're talking about phasing some jobs out and transitioning other jobs over. That never goes over well. All right, let's jump to our next story, story number four. So as a maritime historian, there are some aspects of maritime history that people become enamored with. And there are other aspects that are just, everybody knows is terrible. So if you look in the history of, of, of ocean shipping, Slave trade, abysmal. It was an abysmal business to be in, but it was extremely profitable. Whaling, for some reason we romanticized whaling and whaling was terrible. It was a terrible industry. It was, it was just God awful. And more importantly, the people who did it really weren't the top crust of the sailing industry. And in modern day, the, the element where we see this really playing out is in livestock transportation. Not many countries and shipping companies do this but it does happen. And the problem with livestock transportation is it tends to get regulated over to 
very unreputable and, and, and just, just not well administered ships. And we saw a case of this the other day. Here's the story from Bloomberg on G Captain. Thousands of sheep drowned in Red Sea as Sudan ship founders. This is just a horrific story. About 16,000 sheep bound for Saudi Arabia drowned when an overloaded ship founded off Sudan's Red Sea coast. The ship sank late Saturday, shortly after setting sail from the eastern Sudanese port of Suakin. The organization had said, by phone. The Sudan Tribune News website estimated financial loss at about $4 million, citing officials it didn't identify. Sudan, which is mired in an economic crisis, saw a coup in October and one of Africa's largest livestock populations with Egypt and Gulf states being major buyers. Sudanese port authorities didn't mention, uh, didn't immediately answer a call uh, seeking comments. The, the images are just, uh, just horrible here. And if you've never experienced this or saw animals die or drowned, it, it, it's, it's, it's not a, a pleasant sight, obviously. You won't see it here. But uh, this is the ship capsizing at the berth. Stability in a ship this size is always a problem, especially with moving cargo like this with water and, 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 and food and, and, and the cargo moves. And if the cargo moves to one side, the cargo shifts. You literally get almost like a free service effect of sheep moving. And this vessel eventually capsized uh, at the berth, which is just a, a, a horrific sight. I've been a volunteer firefighter for 20 years. One of the worst accidents I ever went to was a truck hauling chickens that went off a road into a creek. And that was just, I, I can still see it in my head. It, it, it's not a pleasant sight. And this is 16,000 sheep being moved. Uh, this is not well regulated. It tends to happen between countries, not in the mainstream. So you're going from Sudan to Saudi Arabia. Who's inspecting these vessels? Uh, you know, not a lot of port state control here over these vessels. And unfortunately, what we see are animals die. And that is unfortunately the the, the norm here. We've seen this happen with sheep, cows, pigs, you name it. Uh, these, these livestock carriers are just terrible, terrible vessels. And, and like I say, when an accident happens, there's, there's little margin here to save the cargo, which is, is these animals. So I, I, I don't mean to be a downer here, I apologize, but I think it's important to report on these stories so you know about this, because I think there needs to be more visibility about this going out there. Uh, you know, th there's a story every now and then that, that's floated around from the groups that oppose the Jones Act about cattle having to be flown from Hawaii to uh, uh, the United States. Listen, it's better and quicker to transport animals by air than by ship, in my opinion, because it's less confining time for them. You move them faster, you, 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 you minimize the risk for them, you know, we don't move people by ships largely for a good reason. And, you know, yet we still move animals in these bulk like this. Uh, again, this, this is just a, a horrific story. So I apologize for having to share it with you. But again, I think it's important you see all aspects of it. I talk about a lot of fun stuff in here and some great stories. But again, sometimes you need to see kind of the dark side of shipping. And that's one of the two dark sides, unfortunately, we're going to look at. I got another one right here. Last story and uh, for, for the, this week, and I apologize for getting out late this week. Uh, schedule has just been absolute crazy. I hope to get it out uh, earlier uh, on Wednesday this week, but unfortunately I got delayed. But this story here is one I've talked about quite a bit, and this is the Midshipman X story. This is a uh, midshipman at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy who came forward anonymously and talked about sexual assault and sexual harassment on board a Maersk line ship, specifically a Maersk lines limited. This is the subset of Maersk that operates ships under the U.S. registry. Well, this article by Mike Scholler talks about it, and there's multiple articles on this. I just grabbed Mike's to put it up here, has identified the one of the two uh, complaints in a lawsuit against, uh, against Maersk. And uh, the, the, the midshipman, uh, whose name is Hope Hicks, uh, is a senior at um, the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. 
and she has filed suit because of the events that took place on board a Maersk Line vessel, specifically a car carrier, the motor vessel Alliance Fairfax. Uh, this first complaint filed on behalf of Hopes Hicks, uh, uh, it was what became known as Midshipman X. And she has basically put this suit against them for assault and harassment. There is another complaint in, in this too, who was not identified, identified as Midshipman Y. And both these complaints are talking about issues of sexual assault and sexual harassment on board vessels. Hicks complaint alleges that she was the only woman aboard the assigned Maersk vessel during the sea year in 2019, and that while on board, she was, she was raped by one of the ship's top ranking officers, a man of more than 40 years or senior. According to the complaint, when Hicks confronted the officer, she was told no one would believe her if she were made a report. Hicks says she now suffers from severe and ongoing emotional distress as a result. Understand something, you're on a ship isolated out in the ocean and your attacker is not only your boss, but your attacker has a key that opens your door in which you sleep in every night. And the captain, the officers on board don't believe the allegation leveled against you and you're the only woman on board. This is absolutely an abhorrent issue that went on. And I, I don't wanna say something beyond my reach here, but I wanna thank everybody who watches this. I got over about 45,000 subscribers, over almost 5 million views of this channel. When I filed this story a few months ago about this initially, and it was, I was one of the first ones to say something about this, I actually got called by the transportation department and a very senior person I talked to about the issue. And one of the things in the maritime industry that everyone in the maritime industry knows that if you spill oil accidentally, you're in a lot of trouble. You, you're going to get the EPA on board, the Coast Guard on board. You're going to be investigated. You're, you're every, everything that has gone wrong on your ship, you're going to be looked at. Look at the, the case of the ships dragging anchor and hitting the oil pipeline off California. Once they realized it, there was a huge investigation about that and to figure out what ship did it, investigation. Yet, if there's sexual assault, sexual harassment on a vessel, almost nothing was done. There wasn't a number to call. There was nothing to do there was almost no complaints against it. And I went before the Coast Guard and talked about this. I was like, how many sexual assault, sexual harassment cases have you had? And there was no way to do it. And they've, they've addressed this. They've finally addressed this. There are methods in place. There's 1-800 numbers, there are apps, there's all these things to do. They're pairing up midshipmen by sex now, which they should have been doing in the first place because they had an issue back in 2016 about this that they still didn't address correctly. But now they're doing it. And in sexual assault, sexual harassment, and it, happens, it happens not just to women, too. Let's be clear. It happens to men, too. So, you know, this needs to be addressed and put forward. And if it is bad in the U.S. March Marine, imagine what it's like in some registries that don't have the protection that the United States has. And that's a concerning issue that needs to go forward. So I, I want to salute Midshipman Hicks for coming forward. I, I think when a young woman like that takes that risk and, and comes forward with it. It's, it's not easy because everyone's going to point fingers at this young lady when in truth they should be pointing fingers at the assailant and then everybody who didn't cover it up. In my opinion, everything rests on the master's shoulder. He or she should be the end result. If somebody comes and complains about a sexual assault, sexual harassment, they have to treat it like it's true and take action about it and report it and investigate it. It has to be done. You can't do it. So sorry about the two end stories. It didn't really end on a very positive note. On another note, however, be, uh, keep an eye out. Got a couple of great videos in the works coming out. One is Madeline Walchko and the crew of the President Wilson are out of Shanghai at sea. They're in uh, tonight in the port of Busan. Uh, they leave Busan shortly, heading east across the Pacific. So I want to make sure to get a good video out as they head back toward the United States after 100 plus days in a Shanghai shipyard. Uh, doing a video for next week on the top 30 container ports. And I even got a little preview here. The big Lego bricks are back out again. So we're going to be talking about that. And of course, we'll be talking about the Ocean Shipping Reform Act in some more detail. So if you hadn't done so yet, please take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, 
give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, share it across social media. And if you can, head on over to the Patreon page and help support the page. Taking my summer off from teaching so that I can put together more videos and develop the channel. And if you don't want to become a Patreon, that's fine. There's a super thanks button down there and you can give money to help support the channel in that way. I appreciate everything you do. We are actually making this channel a a influencer, I guess, and actually making changes. And the sexual assault, sexual harassment aspect of this is a perfect example of how you watching this channel, subscribing to the channel, giving me the views has allowed me to literally talk to the people who make decisions for the US Merchant Marine. And I am in ever thanks for that ability. And I take it with, with a lot of hum humility. And I hope to do the best I can to, to do what I can, what little I can to support those mariners who are out there. All right, until the next video, Sal, signing off. Hope you enjoyed the shirt tonight. This is, is one of my favorite shirts. I hope you enjoyed it.